The moments you decide to bloodlust can either make or break your keys. If you pop lust at the right time, your runs can be quick and painless. But lusting at the wrong times can ruin tempo, destroy cooldowns, and turn a boss from slightly hard to completely impossible. Today, we're going to go through each dungeon one by one, giving you a cheat sheet on the most crucial times to bloodlust, on both tyrannical and fortified. And for those of you looking for a full dungeon cheat sheet, we just released our Atal Dazar and Waycrest Manor courses with the remaining dungeons on the way. In these courses, we've done the hard work for you and put together the most important tips that elite players actually use to master the most challenging parts of each dungeon and time the hardest keys. We also worked with Merez, who took the time to go through his own keys in a brand new course, where he explains his thought process in each dungeon one pull at a time. Along the way, he points out his own mistakes, showing you exactly what to avoid during your runs. This is a rare opportunity to learn from one of the best players in WoW history, and implement proven strategies into your own gameplay that are guaranteed to make you play better and smarter in your next run. So after this video, be sure to check out our brand new course at skillcap.com and learn more about our rating game guarantee. You can even use the links below for an exclusive discount offer to sign up. For now, let's get back to the video. First, we'll kick things off with Atal Dazar, where the 30 minute timer allows us to have three uses of Bloodlust if we use it early on. In Atal Dazar, it's crucial that we have Bloodlust available for the last boss, Yasma, due to how difficult it can be on both affixes. So by using our first Bloodlust early on, we will be able to have it back for Yasma, as well as have it available in the middle of the dungeon for speed. Because of Atal Dazar's layout, with the first boss, Rezen, being very close to the entrance, we are going to have two choices with our initial Lust depending on affixes. If it's fortified, we're going to be using it on one of the packs on either the left or the right of the stairs. This is because you're going to get the full value from your cooldowns due to the mob's increased health, and will allow you to avoid more heavy hitting mechanics from the empowered mobs. However, if the affix is tyrannical, using Bloodlust on Rezan is the optimal strategy. This is not because Rezan is a particularly difficult boss, it's just that the trash mobs die so fast on tyrannical that you would waste a significant portion of Bloodlust duration on them as you travel towards the next fight. As mentioned earlier, this is a 3 lust dungeon. So our next use is going to be as soon as it comes off cooldown, which will allow it to come back for its final charge in time for Yasma. A great spot to use this is the middle pack if you choose to do it, as the mini bosses of the Dynamancer Kisho and their dinosaurs Talonja and Manzumi, along with the Toxic Sarids, can be a little challenging. This pack is the hardest between the first pull and the last due to its large cleave damage from the Sarids and the wild thrash ability from Manzumi, as well as the mini bosses just having so much HP compared to any other mobs in the dungeon. If you don't pull this pack, ensure you use Bloodlust on another group of trash bombs in between. Otherwise, you'll end up using Bloodlust on Priestess Alunza, who already dies from her own transfusion ability. And according to our experts, it's mathematically impossible to kill Priestess Alunza faster with Bloodlust unless you can deal 25% more damage to skip a phase entirely. Finally, our last use of Bloodlust is going to be for the last boss, Yasma, who is the hardest boss in the dungeon. At this point, you should have your cooldowns and Lust ready, allowing you more breathing room as the room fills with spiders from Yasmo's mechanics. The main takeaway from Bloodlusting and Atal Dazar is to be aware of its dungeon timer to get the most uses, as the majority of the bosses are trivial, but the last, which you should have Lust back for, regardless. Next up is Galakron's Fall, with its 34 minute timer, which can allow 4 potential uses of Bloodlust. Unlike Atal Dazar, Galakron's Fall has two strict rules to Bloodlust, in which you must lust the second boss, Manifested Timeways, and the last boss, Eridicron, due to how difficult the mechanics can prove to be. Because of this knowledge, we can then work backwards to the dungeon and figure out where we can place our other Bloodlust to enable our strategy of using Hero, where we need to skip mechanics. Due to the length and mob density of the dungeon, we can allow our first Bloodlust to be used on the first pull grouping up as many Time Slicers and Chrono Weavers as your party can handle, and destroying them with your offensive cooldowns. This is effective as the first boss is pretty trivial, therefore Lust is not needed, and by Lusting this early, we can guarantee we will have it for the second boss, as well as shaving time off the run by syncing it with our first set of offensive CDs. Our second Bloodlust, as mentioned earlier, is on the Manifested Timeways boss, which can one-shot on Tyrannical and higher keys with Chrono Fade, so having Lust here is key. The added time allows you to skip mechanics and finish it off far earlier, minimizing the amount of mistakes your team can make, while also allowing your healer an easier time to deal with Chrono Fade due to their increased healing output. Following this, there's two different routes you could take for your next loss. The first is using it on cooldown, as this will allow you to have it back on a late phase of a Riddick run if you're running at a slower than normal pace. However, when doing this, do be mindful of your team's cooldowns with Omni CD to see if they have the ability to really get the most out of the Bloodlust before you pop it, 
as it's generally always worth holding onto just a little longer if it will allow it to sync up with CDs like a Havoc Demon Hunter's Metamorphosis. Alternatively, if you're running at a faster pace, you can hold your Bloodlust till you reach the final pack of Epic Rippers, Eridicon's Creation, and Infinite Chronomancers. By using your Bloodlust here, you can cleave the mobs down with the boss, allowing you to avoid two shield phases due to your overwhelming damage. In conclusion, this dungeon teaches us that Bloodlust is a necessity for some bosses as the mechanics are deadly, and by working out which bosses we absolutely must lust to survive, we can fit in our added lust to finish in a better time. Moving on, we have Murazan's Rise, which is another dungeon with four potential Bloodlusts. Since this dungeon doesn't have many dangerous bosses, lusting on cooldown is generally how you want to play it to increase your speed, as well as syncing up with the dungeon's powerful adds. It's very standard to lust the first trash pack as you have all your cooldowns available, but if you're untyrannical and think your group will struggle on the first boss, you can potentially hold it for tier. Following this, you'll then have Bloodlust for the dragons either before or after the gauntlet, depending on when you first used it. Having Bloodlust for these mobs is really handy as they not only do large pulsing AoE damage, but they simply have a lot of health, so lusting here will save you a lot of time. If you're lusting after the gauntlet, it's also pretty assured that you're going to have your offensive cooldowns up as well due to the downtime, so lusting here will give you the most value. For the third lust, there's a variable depending on if the weak is tyrannical or fortified. If it's fortified, you can use Bloodlust on the destroyer as its volatile mortar ability will do massive damage. Otherwise, if it's tyrannical, you can just save it for Anduin or Grommash, as their abilities will be far more dangerous than the trash. And finally, for the last lust, you of course use it as soon as it comes up on Deos when your cooldowns are ready. You can't really go wrong with your bloodlust timings on Murazan's Rise due to the gauntlet intermission, easy to handle bosses, and length of the dungeon. Next up, we have Waycrest Manor, another dungeon with four potential bloodlusts due to its 37 minute timer. In Waycrest, you are met with a lot of dangerous bosses, so we're going to be aiming to have Bloodlust for each of these pressure points. Because of the length of the dungeon, we actually don't waste any charges by doing this either, so for our first Lust, we're going to be sending it on the Sisters. Using Bloodlust on the Sisters is great as they have many casts that must be dealt with that can quickly become overwhelming, so having Bloodlust to make this boss pass by faster will allow you much more breathing room. Alternatively, if you feel confident on Sisters and it's a fortified week, there's no harm in Bloodlusting the first trash pack as you will have all of your cooldowns available. Following our first lust, we're going to be using it next on the Soulbound Goliath. This boss has basically been described as unfair with its thorn mechanic and must be killed as soon as possible or you're going to run out of ways to deal with it. After this, we're going to be looking to use our next bloodlust when it comes up so that we can have it ready for the last boss. To make this bloodlust most effective, we can choose to use it on either Rael the Gluttonous or Matron Alma, as both of these are equally difficult. The main takeaway here is just get it on cooldown to not waste an opportunity to use it. If your Bloodlust isn't quite off cooldown before you reach one of these bosses, you can simply pull more adds for percentage first. This will allow you to recover your Bloodlust and your offensive cooldowns, allowing for the boss to be far easier. Finally, we have the last boss which we will now have Lust ready for as we should have used it on cooldown previously. When pulling Gorak, don't worry if you don't quite have Lust back though, as you should have it at some point during the fight, and waiting for it to come off cooldown before pulling is never the right choice. Moving on, we have Black Rook Hold with another 4 potential Bloodlusts. Black Rook Hold, like some of the previous dungeons, has a difficult last boss that must have Lust saved for it. Due to this, it's very important you think about your Lust ahead of time, once again working backwards from the last boss to decide where you will place Lust throughout the dungeon. Because the only real pressure point of Black Rook is the last boss, we can freely Lust the first trash pull to save time, regardless of the affix. As for the next one, you should have it up for Ilisana Ravencrest as it comes off cooldown, which is great as her bleed ability can be hard to heal on higher keys, so having the extra haste can help your healer out. Following this, depending on your group's speed, you can Lust Smash Spite if you're slow and will have it back in time for Dantelion Axe. Or if you're moving at faster pace, you can just hold it for Dantelion Axe. The key takeaway here is to just make sure you have it for the last boss as its Shadow Bolt abilities can deal so much damage that they even start one-shotting on higher keys. Let's continue with the only Warlords of Draenor dungeon on the list, the Everbloom. Here you will be lusting the first big trash pack. This is because the first boss, Witherbark, is very trivial and quite far into the dungeon, so holding onto your lust would result in a lot of missed time. Following this, you'll want to be using it on two difficult bosses. These being the second boss of the Ancient Protectors, which requires a lot of interrupts, so using it here to skip mechanics will allow you a smoother run and will also allow you to have it for the last boss, Yalnu, which, although its mechanics aren't particularly difficult to deal with, can do a lot of damage, as well as spawning an add that must be taken down quickly. 
Moving on is Darkheart Thicket, which has a 30 minute timer that makes Bloodlust timings very tight. As with many of the dungeons we have already covered, Darkheart Thicket has a very powerful mandatory Bloodlust boss with its final boss, Shade of Zavius. Because of this, we must work backwards to see where we can place a Bloodlust 10 minutes earlier to get the maximum efficiency from this cooldown. With the dungeon timer being 30 minutes, this also means our first Lust must be very fast into the dungeon to allow for 3 uses. Fortunately though, the first boss is very close to the entrance, so if it's tyrannical, we can afford to hold it for Archdruid Glodalis. This can be a good strategy on Tyrannical due to the boss's mechanics filling up the room with Nightfall on the ground, meaning the longer it lives, the less room you have to play with, as the Nightfall debuff will deal damage if you come into contact with it and summon adds. If you're unfortified though, you can just pull the trigger on Bloodlust on the first ad pack as these can dish out huge damage with their Grievous Rip combined with Maddening Roar, making them deadly if not dealt with. For our second Bloodlust, we then have to use it as soon as it comes off cooldown to have it available for Shade of Zavius. If you're on Tyrannical, you can just Lust Oak Heart as the Shattered Earth and Nightmare Breath can deal huge damage to your tank, and you'll still have it back in time for Zavius. If we are on Fortified, we'll be placing it on the Nightmare Dweller pack before Oak Heart. On Fortified, this pack can be a pain to deal with due to their tormenting eye channel that must be stopped or you will become crowd controlled. Due to the affix increasing their health, there is a chance you can run out of stops for their cast and white to their CC. So Lusting here isn't just convenient, but will also allow you to live this mechanic. Our final Bloodlust will of course be on Zavius when he is at 50% health. This is because he will start spawning puddles under your party, which the boss will absorb to become empowered. Therefore, Lusting here turns the boss into a race, as the faster you kill it, the less damage it can deal through its empowers. And finally, we have Throne of the Tides, a dungeon with 4 potential Bloodlusts, although it will commonly only see 3 be used. This is because the last boss is pretty trivial, with 30 seconds of roleplay at the end, thus making placing a Bloodlust here a bit of a waste. Our first Bloodlust is going to just be at the start. This will allow you to get as many uses of Lust as possible and really maximize your cooldowns on Cleave due to the amount of mobs, especially if your group decides to pull the Sentinel pack as well. Following this, our second Lust will then line up with Commander Ultok. This boss can prove difficult if the fight goes on for too long due to its bubbling Fissure Pools mechanics spawning adds throughout the encounter, while also making you run out of room. If you're feeling confident, you can even pull one pack of casters with the boss by pulling Ulthok into the pack to maximize your Bloodlust effectiveness. For our next and potentially final Bloodlust, we have a few places we can use it, depending on what affix it is. For Tyrannical Keys, using Lust on Uranax Stone Speaker can be a great choice due to his Storm Flurry Totem increasing his attack speed and the Flame Shock that must be dispelled coming faster than a healer can deal with. For Fortified Keys, however, you'll be looking to use this Lust on any trash pack for speed, although we recommend using it on the Faceless Watchers, Faceless Seers, and the Minions of Gersha. We'd put it here because of their Null Blast ability, which you can be gripped into by the Quenching Tentacles, so being able to skip as many grips as possible will allow you to deal with this mechanic easier. These mobs also have a lot of HP, so having Lust here will allow you to burn them down faster, allowing you to do better on time. As mentioned earlier, you won't need Lust for the last boss, as it is more about control rather than damage race, so use it to deal with adds and clear pools instead. Alright guys, before we wrap up, want to remind of our brand new dungeon courses where you can learn the most important tips that elite players actually use to master the most challenging parts of each dungeon and time the hardest keys. We also had Meraz put together full commentaries for every dungeon this season, which can only be found at skillcap.com. In this brand new course, Meraz explains his thought process behind every pull and even points out some of the most common mistakes that players make when navigating pushing higher keys. This course goes hand in hand with all of our class guides, which teach you high level information you need to do the biggest damage, while also learning how to abuse mechanics that increase the value of your entire toolkit, including CC and survivability. All of this and more is why Skillcap continues to offer a rating gain guarantee, where we promise that you will be able to increase your IO score while using our guides. So if you want to stay ahead of the competition this season, visit skillcap.com using the link below. All right, everyone, that's it for this one. We hope that with this video, you not only learn where to bloodlust this season, but also understand the underlying concepts of how and why we place them at each spot. If you have any other bloodlusts you like doing, let us know in the comments down below. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.